Do you like the idea of seeing yourself quoted in the newspaper, interviewed on radio or TV, and just generally sought out by journalists hungry for your opinion? Well, my guest today has mastered the art of doing just that. Oh, and she's also Telstra Young Businesswoman of the Year. Let's do this. Welcome to the Small Business Big Marketing Show, where successful small business owners share their secrets to tank your marketing to the next level. Now, here's your host, Tim Reid. Welcome back, listeners, to another episode of Australia's number one marketing show. I am your host, Timbo Reid, but you, so much more importantly, are a motivated small business owner ready to crank out some great marketing, and that is is what I want to do with you right now. Big show today. Got a little fireside chat with Telstra Young Businesswoman of the Year, Tina Tower of Begin Bright. Love that name, Tina Tower. It's got a good syntax to it. We cover a lot of ground in this interview, so hang tight for that. Lots of marketing ahas, and we lead into how you can generate a whole lot of free publicity in local and national media for your your business. Plenty on that to come. Stay tuned. Got a listener question. Ideas for promoting the opening of her new store. Like that. Got the marketing motivational quote of the week and a little insight into upcoming guests, which I'll share with you at the end of the show. Plenty to cover. Let's get stuck right in. Small Business Big Marketing with Tim Reid. Smallbusinessbigmarketing.com So, I reckon it's time for a little check-in. I don't think I checked in with you last week. So how are you? Business good? You good? You love what you do? Today's guest loves what she does. Boy, oh boy. Passion with a capital P. Love it. That is coming up shortly, but I hope you're good. I hope hope you've had a good week. I hope you've got a good week planned. There's some fun stuff to do, maybe some tough stuff to do, but, you know, we've got to do both as small business owners. Do you do the tough stuff first or the easy stuff first? I do the easy stuff first. There is a book called Eat That Frog, which suggests doing the tough stuff first, but, yeah, not into that. My arm's still sore. Yeah, it's making me a bit tired, a bit tired and cranky. Saw the surgeon this week, didn't have an operation, just checked in. He said, yeah, you're 80% better, slow down, stop trying to think you're Superman. So yeah, a little bit sore and, you know, can't spend too much time at the desk. Can spend plenty of time at the microphone, which I like. That's at the desk, but it requires less mouse work. I've been putting in lots of proposals Got a really good idea at the speakers retreat that I talked about the other week that I was on in Noosa and um, been putting in a lot of proposals to conference organisers that I spoke, whose conferences I spoke at last year, uh, suggesting that I could help them keep the conference alive in their delegates' mind this year. And it involves me doing videos and podcasts exclusive to their con- exclusively for their podcast delegates and it's been received really well nice little idea there which was you know like for me up until I got that idea um, I got paid to do the keynote and that's kind of where it ended but now I'm being taught to extend my offering because one of the biggest problems conference organizers have is how do we keep the conference alive in the mind of the delegates after they get back to their business and get stuck back into the busyness of business. So I uh, came up with the Keep the Conference Alive program, thanks to a great mate of mine, Keith Abraham, who's going to be on this show in coming weeks, talking about living your passion. And it's been really well received. Bit of pain, a bit of creative tension in writing that proposal, but it's all come together really well. Um, tiredness has kind of slowed me down a bit with the old arm, but have also had a big opportunity come my way, which kind of lit my flame again, and I'm back, back in the uh, back in the game. Had a couple of days to this week where I was just kind of going, oh yeah, yeah, this could be tough. But you know what? When those 
big opportunities come along and you think, oh, wow, how did I track that? It kind of lights your flame again. So I hope those opportunities are coming your way. They don't have to be really big, but just opportunities that, that light your fire. Anyway, that's kind of me. Hopefully uh, you're doing okay yourself. Love to hear from you. We talk a lot about how we're going inside the Small Business Big Marketing Forum. So kind of, I'd love to know how you're going and come and have a chinwag about your business. If you like the idea, head over to crankmymarketing.com. Righto, so as you know, this show is made possible by the very good folk at Net Registry, and they offer a free service over at the Small Business Big Marketing website at smallbusinessbigmarketing.com. You can post a question about any aspect of your online marketing, and they will answer it. NSA, no strings attached, also known as the National Speakers Association. Weird acronyms, hey? Um, and But it's all free, and there's no strings attached. So if you have got an online marketing question, doesn't matter how dumb it is, no such thing as a dumb question when it comes to online marketing, Net Registry are there to sort it out. What's a domain name? What do I do about SEO? What is SEO? Why do cornflakes go soggy in hot milk? No, you can't ask that because they won't, they won't answer that. They won't know because they're not into that whole chemistry thing. But any online marketing question, for sure. So if you head over to smallbusinessbigmarketing.com and click on the net registry banner on the right-hand side, that'll take you to an exclusive blog where they answer your questions about online marketing. If you want to get started with some online marketing, website, domain, whatever it is, head over to netregistry.com.au and tell them Timbo sent you. Right, let's get stuck into a listener question. This one's from Catherine. She's kindly recorded her question. Let's hear what she's got to ask. Hi, Tim. My name's Catherine Maslin. I have a business called Brisbane Natural Health, which is a multimodality health clinic where we specialise in helping people feel good again so that they can live the life of their dreams. We're about to move into a bigger premises, and I was hoping that you could give me some advice on promotions leading up to our open day. So, We're having a grand opening where we're going to be having a health expo with all kinds of of things. And I'm considering radio advertising um, and a number of other means. And I'm wondering if you have had any little hot tips that you think might help us make the opening really special. Thanks, Tim. Really enjoy your show. Bye. Great question, Catherine. Love it. Ideas to promote the opening of her store. Love it. Well, guess what? We have got a small business big marketing forum member who asked exactly the same question recently inside the forum. Kate at Sweet Fern in Ballarat. Great store. If you're in Ballarat team, head over to sweetfern.com.au. Check her out. It's kind of like a nice smelling store. (laughs) She sells scents and perfumes and stuff like that. She's rocking it. Got some really good stuff happening. But she asked the same question about how to launch uh, the opening of her store. And here's some of the things that came through in from four members. Number one, targeted Facebook ads with an offer redeemed on launch day. Love that. Facebook ads are so good because you can target them to within an inch of their life. Uh, Number two, do a joint venture with other local businesses and groups. Could involve putting together some kind of show bag that you give away on the day and promote prior to the day to attract people to attend. Um, Number three, do an info session on ways to pamper yourself each day without spending a fortune. Now, that was an idea for Kate's business, but for Catherine's business, um, you could do an info session on ways um, to increase your well-being that are easy and don't cost a fortune. And you could promote that and run that session on your open day. Another idea, gift packs uh, for local real estate agents and car dealers. This is not so much for the open day, but this is a great way to immerse your business, Catherine, into the local community. When someone buys a new car, when someone buys a new house or leases a home within the area, do deals with the agents and um, and car dealers so that they uh, that your product is given as a gift to those people. Another idea, have a hashtag and Twitter ID front and center 
during your open day. Even have a live feed projected onto a wall in your store uh, and get the, uh, get the conversation started online there and then. Idea number six, have a guest speaker. Have a good guest speaker who's going to attract a crowd. Uh, and share some wonderful insights. Make sure you record it. Make sure you post it on your YouTube channel. Put it on your website. Send it out to your mailing list. You got a mailing list, right? And you could do that. Idea number seven, get a street team. Pound on the pavement, handing out uh, invites to people in the lead up to the day and on the day. And last idea is to welcome people on the night with your why speech, Catherine, why do you do what you do? We're going to talk about this with Tina shortly, but if you've got a powerful why for having a well-being business, then share it and record that too, by the way. Really, really powerful. Hey, Catherine, thanks for your question. Loved it. Listeners, if you've got a marketing question that you'd like answered tomorrow and maybe not wait till I answer it on an upcoming episode, Join the Small Business Big Marketing Forum. Head over to crankmymarketing.com and I will see you inside the inner circle. Right, let's get stuck into today's guest. It is Tina Tower. She is Telstra Young Businesswoman of the Year. She owns a business called Begin Bright, which is all about getting our young people school ready. And she also offers primary tutoring as well. You can find her on Twitter at Begin Bright. Hit her up. Tell her you love what she's doing, that you heard her on the Small Business Big Marketing Show. My Twitter is at Timbo Reed, R-E-I-D. But go on, hit Tina up at Begin Bright and tell her you heard her right here. Love that. So we go deep on a treasure trove of business and marketing, G-O-L-D. Gold on the That's it, gold on the ceiling. Tina talks about and shares her why. We talk about franchising. We talk about growing pains. We talk about attracting the right people and how to to secure free publicity. Oh, my goodness. Get a cup of tea. Put your feet up. Notepad, pen, full of ink. You're going to need it. I started off by asking Tina about her favourite memory of school. Of school? My fondest memory of school, goodness me, uh, probably leaving. (laughs) (laughs) Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Didn't Um, you like it? I mean, I liked school. I loved learning. I had great teachers. But, for example, when I finished high school, I had three jobs in my final year of high school. So, (laughs) by that stage, I really just wanted to get out into the world and make some money rather than sit there learning things that I thought I never knew yeah, I never right. Never needed to know. Never needed to know. Isn't yeah. that interesting? Because, you know, now with Begin Bright, here you are getting young people, very young people, ready for school, which we'll talk exactly. about in a minute. Before I do, I noticed you teared up on stage at the Telstra Business Awards. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, so well done for being Telstra <laughs> Young Businesswoman of the Year. That is, how's, how's that feel? Uh, amazing. Still, um, still a little bit surreal. I mean, it was that was the kind of thing that you know when you when you start a business and you go one day, one day I might be that awesome, and and then you get there and you go, no, I think they've got that a bit wrong. Um, but yeah, it's just it's it's very cool. It's very cool. I should be a lot more humble about it, but I'm not. No, it's go really for gold. Awesome. <laughs> do, do, um, do you feel like an imposter? I uh, yeah, there's quite a bit of that. Um, there's, yeah, you definitely have have those moments, but you know, it's once afterwards I stopped and reflected on how far we've actually come since the beginning. And one of those things I can just look at my marketing material that I used in my first couple of years of business and see how far we've come from there. So yeah, yeah. yeah but I mean, I think as a business owner, as soon as you hit goals, you just raise the bar continuously higher and higher. So it, you've got to really stop sometimes and go, look how far we've come. So interesting because the imposter things come up um, not in those words. In fact, I've been reading a little bit about that of recent times, but I know uh, we've kind of touched on it with past guests. What what do you do when you feel as though, gosh, am I really worthy of this? How do you overcome that? Do you just remind yourself of how far you've come? Yeah, well, I think um, our business changed a lot when I switched my mindset to go, you know what, I am 
worthy and deserving and all of that sort of thing of it, uh, that was really a big turning point in the whole business for us. So it's it's really important to get your mindset in the pri- in the right part of the game. Um, but I do a lot of self development and all of that rah rah stuff that some people think is really corny. Yeah. And I love that shit. <laughs> oh yeah, me too. Okay, let's let's go there because I was yeah. listening to a podcast this morning. How's this? This is with. And it's actually not something I would normally listen to, and I didn't like the topic, but it was um, Osher Ginsburg, you know, Andy G. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Okay, he's got a podcast. Really enjoy it. Um, He was interviewing a Navy SEAL sniper. Wow. Okay, so a a guy who kills people for a living. Yeah, yeah. Uh, And he talked a lot about the woo-woo stuff. Uh, For him, him it was at the level of, like, getting your breathing right, doing all the breathing Mm. exercises, bringing yourself to that level. But uh, I I love the woo-woo stuff. And that personal development, um, I talked about on this show a couple of episodes ago where I've just been away on a retreat with some other speakers. and. You know, I was sitting amongst giants and we were all talking about the various personal development things we do. And yes. I, I reckon as business owners, we, as, as a whole, don't do enough of it. Yeah. You know? What, what do you do? Um, I do a lot. So I, I read a new book every couple of weeks and it's not always about um, like standard business stuff. Sometimes it's about psychology and sometimes it's about relationships and all sorts of different things that I read every couple of weeks so that I can always get different perspectives on things that help. Uh, and I have a 20-minute drive to and from work, so I listen to audio books the whole way. At the moment, I'm listening to um, Vince Lombardi, who was a American gridiron coach way back in the 70s and 80s uh, and he, he talks about how it's it's called winning ways mm-hmm. so how he got his his team to go from losers to winners and so all of that sort of thing I've done a lot of Anthony Robbins courses and John D Martini so I love going to live events too and Junkie. submerging in it I know Junkie. I know yeah 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 absolutely <laughs> love so, it so yeah got it got to see in it because I mean there's always and because of my business as well I'm quite passionate about learning and being open to learning new things and I think that's the only way we can evolve and get better is to yeah. learn more stuff as we go through. What you Put the good stuff in, out comes the good stuff. It's as Absolutely. simple as that. I'm yeah, so and it's really that. easy to. I mean, you should never listen to the news to start off with but no. there's so much negativity that, that goes in our brains from the world and I think we've got to make sure that we have good stuff going in there too so that our thoughts become good. I know a good podcast you could listen to on that 20-minute commute. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> hey? <laughs> you with me? Yeah, I'm with you. I'll yeah. download them all straight away. <laughs> oh, I love it. No, that's a, a wonderful uh, starting point. And, you know, it's the simple things. It is books. It's it's audio tapes. Yeah. It's, it's attending events. It's hanging out with positive people. It's drinking exactly. more water. It's stopping and breathing a little bit deeply every now and then and yeah. all that stuff. Love it. So you're rather passionate, Tina. Yes. And I am reckoning – Let's get stuck into the business um, or, or the business that you've created. I'm guessing you've got a really strong why. Yeah, yeah, I like to think so. Can you um, share it? Can you yeah. articulate it? Well, it depends on how briefly you want me to oh, articulate. Go I find it hard to briefly articulate anything really. Yeah, okay. Um, but so my first tutoring centre was started when I was 20. So I was at the end of my second year of uni where I was studying primary teaching mm. uh, and working a few jobs to pay my way through uni. Um, and I really wanted to, to find a way to run my own business at the same time because I've been going to Robert Kiyosaki seminars since I was 16 and wow. started to get into all of that personal development stuff. Uh, so I thought there was a better way than you know, working at the pub for my $15 mm-hmm. an hour. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I thought I'd start tutoring on the side and then that turned quickly into we had a toy store, um, a tutoring centre, a party place and an art and craft centre. Hang so, on, hang on. The, yeah. the, the, the easy said, uh, second year of uni, yeah. you are, I'm guessing you are 18 or 19. I was 20, You're 20. 20 when I started. And yeah. you, had, you had, you said we, who's we? Oh, that's just, I'm conditioned to say we to make myself appear larger. Oh, you're clever. I I like that. (laughs) So you had what? We had a toy store. So I ran an educational toy store and we had a a retail outlet. A retail outlet. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Probably probably one of the worst decisions of my life. Uh, But many lessons learnt, so I can elaborate on that later. Uh, but yeah, so we had that. And then one day a lady came in and asked if we did birthday parties and I said, sure. She went, we how much? And I went, $200. She yeah. went, great. I'll book it in. Yep. Excellent. Take two. 
And then I went, okay, what do I do for birthday parties? So that was how we started doing art and craft and science birthday parties and then tutoring. And so at the beginning, it was just tutoring for primary school because there was no such thing as school readiness really Mm -hmm. around then. And we'd get child after child come in that had major self-confidence and self-belief issues. So Mm -hmm. we'd have, you know, typically the boys that would come in that were in year two and three and they'd come in with that whole tough boy sort of thing going on. Yeah, I still got it. And then... Uh, yeah, a lot of boys still have it. <laughs> but you'd start doing an assessment and they'd just burst into tears and go, I can't do it. I'm dumb. I'm stupid. Everyone's smarter than me. All of that sort of really negative self-talk. And it just it just broke my heart because I thought every day these kids sit in school and they have no clue about what's going on. And it's a really tough job as a classroom teacher. You've got 30 kids that you have to look after and often you've got five at the top that already know what's going on that you can't help and you've got five at the bottom that have no idea and you can't help. So as that teacher's only one person, there's only so much that they can do. So my theory was, well, if we get them before they start school, then maybe we can teach them really positive attitudes to learning so that when they get to school and they realise that they're faced with information that they don't know, rather than going, ah, I don't know it and putting up that wall, they can say, you know what, it doesn't matter if I don't know, I'm a good learner and I love learning, so I'm going to adapt to it. Uh, So that was my idea with school readiness classes. So... Begin and begin bright was kind of born out of that. So is you your why? Because sometimes you can look at a business like Begin Bright, and as a father of three kids, um, I've seen those kind of tutors that you know that you're there to push the kids from a B plus to an A, you know, and it's like that sometimes. And I've, our kids have done a few of those, dare I say, but I've never liked the feeling of those. You're not so much yeah, about no. that. You no. are about to me. Your why yeah. is like helping. I'm going, to, I'm going to put it in real layman's terms so like a six-year-old could understand yeah. it. Like you're about helping <laughs> kids who think they're dumb feel smart or remind yeah. them, not even feel smart, re- show them that they are smart. Is that Yeah. So, I mean, thing? our mission is to create happy, smart and confident children. So I think, you know, even as adults, I love to learn, I love to read, I love to absorb new things and I think that the way we get ahead is by learning new things. But for a lot of people, if they didn't enjoy school and didn't enjoy reading, they'll never then pick up a book later in life. So they're hindered and their opportunities are smaller forever. So I really believe in education and learning and and I want everyone to feel great when they learn. Love it, Tina. Now, tell us, what did the first incarnation of Begin Right look like and how did you get it to market? Uh, so it was it was a little bit tricky at the beginning. So I had the bright idea to start school readiness classes. Uh, only thing was that nobody knew what school readiness <laughs> classes were and everyone thought they didn't need them. So that was a great, great service. So, so did you with. coin a phrase? Was it like school readiness? Was that like a new kind of, I mean, I get what it means, yeah. but was that something you'd come up with? Yeah, well now, I mean, it's 10 years, so now people get what it Mm. means, but most of the calls that we got in the early days was people asking if we were a daycare centre. So people thought learning before school was just ridiculous. You know, why why would you, isn't that what school's for? Everyone would say to us. Um, So yeah, we really had the service long before um, anyone needed it. So it was really nice kind of five years into it when people started actually discovering that they could use school readiness. <laughs> isn't that lovely? It's, isn't it lovely when the language you create in your business starts to get fed back to you from your customers? Yeah, exactly. That's amazing. And that was, um, you know, a lot of people always talk about competitors and how bad competitors are, but for us it was the greatest thing because as soon as competitors started popping up, then it raised the awareness of the school readiness and tutoring industry as a whole. So people could then Google search and look for school readiness places and, and there we were, well established. So Love it was it. really good. And you know what? Uh, my favourite saying and what you're doing is building a very strong brand is that people can copy what you do but not who you are and yeah, um, love it. So... Uh, what was the, the challenge was people had no idea that they needed what you had to offer. Mm. What, how did you address that? I wrote a lot. Um, so, which is very embarrassing now because if I ever go back through Google or anything like that, you read what you wrote 10 years ago and go, oh, you do it so much better now. Um, but yeah, I wrote a lot. So we had a very, very small budget. Um, I wrote about everything. Like you mean blogging? 
Blogging, yeah. So I would put articles on absolutely any website that would take them. So articles about business, articles about being a mum in business, articles about children, education, development, whatever I could get out there, I got out there with links back to our site. Love it. Mm. Now, um, are you a writer? You, like, does writing come naturally to you or did Goodness it come out of necessity? Me, no. Goodness me, yeah, no. Yeah, 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 necessity. I mean... Yeah, even now I very rarely reread what I write because mm. if I did, we're far too self-critical humans. <laughs> uh, so I'll often just just bang it out in five minutes, just go, right, this is what you've got to write, just sit down and do it and do it mm-hmm. and send it off without trying to overanalyze it. Otherwise, it's never perfect enough and you, oh, you love won't it. send it off. I love it. Production, not perfection. Exactly. <laughs> you know, and we are, we're so self-critical. We're so, we're, we're so often comparing our worst to others' best and you know yeah, what yeah. What we're putting out generally, it's pretty good. Yeah, and I mean it does It does help people. I mean the only reason I started writing was because I was reading so much of other people's experiences and I thought, well, if I'm getting something from their experience, then surely I could share my experience and someone will get something from that and it can all go around. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Gee, you're ahead of the curve there. You probably didn't even know it, but like getting onto other people's blogs and just writing – what I call helpful content um, yeah. and, and being helpful is useful, you know, and, and, you know, there was a backlinking strategy happening there, of course, because yeah, it was yeah. linking back to your website, which I'm sure yeah. was horrible in your own words. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, great. great. Yeah, 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 very horrible. Okay. But yeah, it was, um, it was through necessity as well. I mean, I think sometimes, you know, I was, I was talking to someone the other day that started a franchise company and they started with $1.5 million as their seed capital. And I went, gosh, that would have been beautiful <laughs> to start off with that capital because you could do so much. But then when I asked how he spent it, he spent it all in the first year and I asked what he spent it all on and a lot of it was so many marketing things mm-hmm. that, that we had also done but we started with 10,000 capital. Mm. So I think sometimes when you don't have the money, it, it teaches you to be really resourceful and and learn a lot of things that other people just pay for. The listeners, long-time listeners of this show, Tina, know that there's never been a better time to market a small business and you just yeah. pro- you just proved it, you know. It's like, yeah. yeah, yeah, you've got to roll the sleeves up. There's no free ride here, but you don't have to have deep pockets. Yeah, that's right. You know, uh, so I love that. So... That's the first incarnation. Um, in 2008, I'm kind of jumping ahead a little bit, but you started to grow and you, you licensed it and then three years later you franchised it. Yeah, that's right. What? Yep. Um, what why? Uh, well, a lot of reasons. One of them was we had the small suburban tutoring centre and I always had this itch to grow and be bigger uh, and I knew that if I had multiple centres, it would all collapse because I didn't have the skills or the want to run multiple centres yeah, right. myself. Uh, I had, so 2008, my first son was born and then I fell pregnant and had another child in 2009. <laughs> so mm. that was really a, a really good slap in the face for me to show me that I'd built a really dreadful business model uh, and one that relied solely upon me and I was going to have no life if it was going to survive. Mm. So I thought, well, we'll scrap it. So I closed the toy store and, and everything everything that I'd built there and closed it down and then just licensed simply the program to other teachers to be able to run. So it was really a um, an evolution through wanting to scale and also through wanting to be more present with my children while they were little as well. Good on you. Mm. What a good thing. And, and that worked like, you know, the licensing, the franchising because – no mean feat. I've not franchised anything, but I've spoken to a few who have, um, <laughs> and that alone is like uh, the amount of work, paperwork, systems, everything. Oh. You know, yeah, right, <laughs> right. It's like nothing I could have ever imagined. Wor- yeah, so. <laughs> Worse than childbirth. Oh, I'm yeah. going to yeah, get into yeah, trouble yeah, yeah. now. I'm going to get into trouble. <laughs> no, 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 I'll agree with that one. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so we licensed. I had no intention to ever turn it into a franchise system. Uh, At the beginning, I thought licensing was definitely our path forward Mm -hmm. uh, and it was working really well for the first 18 months. And then because under a license system, you can license your your products per se, but you can't really license your whole service offering. So they couldn't be called Big and Bright Centres. We weren't able to give them business advice and systems. Uh So they knew that I'd built tutoring centres before and wanted to build their 
their own tutoring centers, but under a licensed system, you can really just give them those products rather than the whole turnkey business operation. So I could have so, I, I could have ABC Learning and be delivering Begin Bright, Begin Bright program. program, okay, whereas exactly. then the franchising thing was all of a sudden, okay, we're now going to have the – you buy a Begin Bright concern, yeah. going concern. Yeah, yeah. So hmm. under a license, you know, there were people doing things that were teaching a Begin Bright program, but they were doing other things that I personally wouldn't want associated with the Begin Bright program, so it's mm-hmm. got a lot of issues there. So I went, um, I went to another four-day business and marketing masterclass <laughs> course yeah. uh, and – someone there mentioned franchising and so while I was sitting there you know I started googling franchising and by the end of the four-day course I'd got in contact with all the lawyers and everything and two months later we were a franchise. Two months? Yeah. Uh, Two months, a lot of hard work, a lot of dough? Yeah, yeah. So um, two months was the time that it took us to kind of set it up and then we didn't actually sell our first one. So we were set up by the January and we didn't actually open the first franchise centre until October. Mm-hmm. So it took took quite a long time there to, um, you know, the first one's always the hardest because mm-hmm. you've built no trust and no reputation and no yeah. proof of concept really. Um, so that was that was just a hell of a lot of marketing. Was it? And, and, and you would have been – there would have been a temptation to – give it to the first person who pulled the checkbook out. But, of course, yeah. that would be the wrong thing. To, it was always the wrong thing to do, yeah. but you've got to have yeah. the right person. Yeah, exactly. And that's really the hardest part about franchising. I mean, we've got really ambitious growth plans now. Last year, we we started the year on nine centres. We finished on 18, so we doubled last year, which was great. And then this year, we want to put on another 15. But wow. a lot of the time, you're interviewing people and you've got to be, especially in a service-based franchise, I think retail franchise, you know, it doesn't really matter so much who the owner is because so much of it is your staff and the products and the products, systems yeah. that are easy to deliver. But in a service-based franchise, I mean, for us, we're tutoring centres and we're dealing with families under pressure and we're dealing with people's children. Mm. So the way that owners interact with those parents and with their teams is so – it's integral to the success of that business. So we need to have the right personality and those right people or the whole business model falls apart. So it's really hard to balance that with wanting to grow fast because you see some people and you you go, they're so peachy keen and they really want one and they're (laughs) willing to give it their all but I know that it's going to turn pear-shaped. So you have to say no, which is really hard when you're in that spot to do. You, I reckon you'd be a person who originally, initially would have found no a hard thing to do, like many of us, you know, no's a hard thing yeah. to say, but a powerful, a powerful strategy as well. Yeah. You're getting better yeah. at it? Um, no. Yeah, I, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I still, I still want to hide when I have to do it. I go, sure, can I just get someone else to do that uh, for me? <laughs> But no, I mean, I I do know how important it is, especially now. I've been franchising for three years. So um, you can see the people that, you know, we knew ticked every box at the beginning are now kicking all their goals. And we go, we just need more people like that. But yeah, those, there's not that many superstars around that fit our bill. So we just have to hunt hard. Are you looking for people now? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but you are, how, do, how do they contact you? Uh, through our website. So all the franchising information is on the Begin Bright website. You can Google Begin Bright. You can Google tutoring franchise. Yeah, You'll cool. find us if I've done my marketing job yeah, right. Yeah, 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 correct. So yeah. tell me, um, you're going from someone, you shared a really powerful why earlier on and you're all about helping young kids and I guess you loved interacting with those young kids and their families and making yeah. them school ready. Uh, you're now well and truly being pulled away from those young kids and parents and you've become a manager, haven't yeah. you? How does that sit with you? Yeah, well, it's, that's a really interesting question actually because we um, – so in 2012, I had a bit of a, a really super early midlife crisis. Had a moment? Yeah, yeah, I had a moment. That's a good way to put it. You mm. had a moment. Um, I'd just gone to Uganda with the Hunger Project and, mm. and that really caused me to have several moments mm. uh, and came back and thought, why the hell am I working this hard and missing my kids and doing all of this and, you know, not getting anywhere? Those moments that everyone that's in early stages of business have. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we decided to chuck it all in in Sydney and we sold up everything and we moved and bought five acres in between Byron and the Gold Coast. Ah. Uh, so we had a huge change there. So we sold our company-owned centre that was in Crown Oh, you mean Sydney. chuck it all in, not just like sell the family home, move to a lovely part of Australia. You mean sell yeah. the business. 
we sold our center. Yeah, so we retained the franchising business, uh-huh. but we sold our center. Um, so yeah, so I moved up and then went from having this bustling center with you know ten teachers working there and other staff on the franchising company, and then started working from home in my room again, which I hadn't been there for about seven years working from home. Mm. Uh, so that was quite a challenge, and you really lost touch with with the why. So in the end, I was going, you know, why am I doing this? And so last October, I opened a centre again in Coolangatta in the Gold Coast. Ah. And so now, which you probably heard the children in the background mm-hmm. earlier, mm-hmm. Um, I can sit in my office and I can still hear kids running around and I can still hear the parents coming in and how oh, proud they wow. are when they're picking up their children. And for me, it makes a huge difference because I've got that immediate thing that when I'm selling a franchise to someone, I can immediately listen to those kids and go, this is why I'm doing it. That's another 200 children like that, that we're reaching through you doing this. When, so When you to- add the next 15 franchises this year, do you think it's realistic that you're still going to be able to be in the Coolangatta Centre and are are you teaching or you are just there to... No. No. So we we built in a second floor. So we've got all of our franchising support offices upstairs with all of our team up there and then we run a a normal centre in the downstairs part. So yeah, it's big enough to grow with us. We'll be right here until we've got about 50 centres. How cool is that? Give us your scoreboard, Tina. Number of centres, anything you want to reveal, turnover, staff, marketing budget, go. Yeah. Well, I mean, a marketing budget is still really small. Um, So we don't spend a huge amount on marketing. We spend about 15,000 a year now, which goes- But you nail marketing, which we're going to talk about very shortly. Yeah. Yeah. And in terms of turnover, we've grown at a rapid rate of knots. So this this year we had 160% profit rise from last year Um, so every year has been like that for the last five years which Mm -hmm. is great Um, but I want it I want it to grow even quicker (laughs) yeah 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 Yeah. Um, we've just put on our first full-time franchise staff uh, which was a big move for me uh, because I've always been the sort of solopreneur uh, and used to doing everything myself so letting go of that control has been Oh, so hard mm-hmm. um, and letting experts come in and do it because, you know, when it's your business, you're the expert. Yeah, okay. Tell me how you did it because I'm not very good at this. What's your tip? No, how do just... you let go of your baby? Um, well, this sounds really, really arrogant. Go. But um, you've just got to accept that it's not going to be done how you would do it, really. So, so arrogant. I think I know, right? <laughs> You know, I read in a book once, I can't remember which book it was lately, but it said you need on average seven people to replace a founder. Um, So when there's someone that's taken a business from inception to establish the work that you do as you know, the owner of the business, you need on average seven people to cover all of those roles. Because when you start, you're the, you're the bookkeeper, you're the marketer, yep. you, you do all of those roles um, and then yep. you need to replace them one at a time. And no one does everything as quickly or as efficiently as you because it's all up in your head. Correct. So we're Correct. just currently now, because we're a franchise system, everything is systemized to win, within it an inch of its life right, yeah. um, in the way that a centre runs. But in the way that the franchise itself runs isn't as systemised. So that's what we're working through now. We've got five staff in the support office and everything anyone does is getting added to our online site for our intranet, for our system. So that in a year's time, if I get hit by a bus, no worries. The business will continue without a blip. Good on you. Yeah. So let's talk marketing. Let's talk marketing. I love the marketing that you do and how you go about it. You say you spend $15,000 a year yeah. on marketing, which as a percentage of turnover would be? Well, our turnover is $2.5 million. Okay, so it is zippity doo yeah. 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 Not your turnover, your, your marketing budget as a yeah, percentage yeah, yeah. to turnover. Yeah. And what are you doing? Uh, well, to me, 15000 is still a lot of money. Of course it is. Um, Absolutely. In anyone's yeah, book. Yeah, yeah. But, but you make it stretch a long way. Absolutely. Yeah. So one thing that I've always done a lot of is PR. Uh, and PR is free, which makes it my favorite sort of marketing. <laughs> De- define PR for us. Uh, so PR is getting on radio, getting on TV, newspapers, magazines. Podcasts podcasts, other online sites, all of that stuff getting yourself and your content all out there. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's something that, you know, a lot of people don't want to be that exposed and it does have its issues being that exposed sometimes. What? Uh, 
<laughs> well, I mean, great. Yeah, I get I mean, sticking your head above the trench or some, someone may challenge us on something we say in an article or an interview. Is that what you mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I mean. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I try and encourage my franchise owners to also put themselves out there and a lot of people just don't want to do it. So, I have a lot of conversations with people that they go, oh, but what if someone doesn't like what I say or what what if they think it's not true? And, mm-hmm. you know, I, I truly believe there's so much contradictory information in the world that you can you can find evidence to support whatever your belief yep. is. Um, and everyone's got their own individual beliefs. All you can do is put out your opinions and what you truly believe in and you'll find your, your clan, your tribe that also believe in that same stuff. And that's who you want. You don't want everyone. You just want your target market. So you, Tina, have been – the marketing that you started 10 years ago when you first started writing blog posts on any blog that you get a post on to, yeah. it's pretty, pretty much is, is, you know, you have continued to do that today. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, every month I send uh, press releases out to local newspapers, magazines. I try and get on as much as I can um, so that we've got a lot of content, so that when anyone's searching for tutoring centres, franchises, whatever it is, our content always out trumps everyone else's and so we're ranking well in Google okay. and, and you've got all that social proof there as well, which is so underestimated. The, the press, the media are looking for stories yeah. How how do you continue to create newsworthy stories and avoid it looking like a sales pitch? Yeah, I think um, the the easiest way to create a story is to be a story. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, someone said that to me the other day. Went, you know, it's easy for you to market. You have a good story. So how, it's like, how is my story different to anybody else's? It's just you're just going out there and going going as hard as you can and 100% and living mm-hmm. the best life that you can. And I think that's interesting to anyone if they put it in those sort of sort of ways. So I think... Give me an example of that. The easiest way to market a story is to be a story. So how does that, how does that play out in your PR strategy? Uh, so I'm not complacent. Uh, so no year is the same as the last year. So someone can, you know, one of the media outlets could call me now and go, so what have you done differently in the last year? And there's so many things that I can talk about. So you don't have, I think so many people and they just do the same thing year after year. And so you're right, there's nothing kind of story worthy in that. So you have to continually evolve and learn and, and go about and do things bigger and better all the time so that they've got something to write about. Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. Because uh, that's the, always the challenge, and um, even getting that first press release. Do you have Do you have a particular structure for your press releases? This is very old school. It's so I know, old, it's beautiful. I know. Um, yeah, I am a bit old school. So <laughs> very, very brief. Very, very brief. I never attach. Um, you know, you like you see people that write those massive word documents, and yeah, then yeah, put yeah. Them as, never ever. No. Um, so I pretty much just you know, hello, uh, a couple of lines of what it is, please give me a call anytime and put my mobile number to talk. And often uh, you never hear a response back. But then when they're looking for something, so whenever an education story comes up or anything to do with, you know, young women in business that I'm not going to be able to play on for very much longer. (laughs) (laughs) But I really could back in the day. Yeah, yeah. Um, But yeah, I'm getting a bit old now. Um, But yeah, anything something like that comes up, they know that they can call me and go, well, I know Tina will be available. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. they'll call and, and they know they can send a photographer straight around and get their story and get the result that they need. And then after every time that we've ever been in a magazine or newspaper or radio or podcast or anything like that, I always make a habit to send a thank you box as well. So I've got, um, at the moment I use Urban Ritual products, which are beautiful sort of um, luxe bath care and candles and all that gorgeous stuff. So whenever anyone does anything like that for us, I send them this big box to their office that's usually gift wrapped. Sometimes if it's local, they have helium balloons attached to it. Uh, And often people never get presents anymore and never get told thank you. So then they open that and they're like, oh my God. One, they think, wow, that's amazing. And secondly, they think that that lady's a bit cuckoo. Um, But it makes makes me stick in their mind so that next time they need something, I'll come to the front of their mind and they'll go, well, that girl was really nice. Let's talk to her. P.O. Box 989, Mount Eliza 3930. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so tell me, um, interesting, because there is a tipping point where 
it, it, well, there's a lot of listeners, a lot of business owners sitting there right now going, oh, no, no media, no journo is going to want to hear about my old business, my, my veterinary clinic or my plumbing business. Well, A, a they do. They have minutes and column centimetres to fill. Yeah. Secondly, you do need to find something compelling to tell them and not send them a brochure. Yeah. What would be your advice on that initial approach? Because you're now at the point where there are journos out there that know, hey, if there's a story about young women in business or if there's a story about our children are getting dumber or whatever it is, call Tina. She'll have a point of view. She's good in the media. But you, you weren't always at that point. What's your advice for those wanting to embark on this strategy? Um, awards were really big for uh-huh. us. Um, so awards are often free to go in and we started at the local awards. So just the local council ran awards and then we went for every national award that there was really. So any award that came up, we went in it uh, <laughs> and we got into the finals of heaps of awards. We didn't win that many mm-hmm. um, actually I was a finalist 27 times before I won an award. Wow. Uh, and if you want to see a crying speech, whoa, that's one. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Love it to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it gave us something to talk about. So whenever we were there, you know, local business finalist in national awards is a great story for the mm-hmm. local paper. And really, if you're a local business, you only want the local paper. You don't want national papers because it's good for the ego, but it's not necessarily going to translate into the bottom line. Correct. So, we want to get things that are going to be right and our target market's going to see it. So awards were really good and then just getting a lot of content out there. So by the time a journo saw my stuff and went, oh, was she worth talking to? And then Googled me, there was all this other stuff. So they went, oh, okay, so there's a bit out there. She's not just some that That's the really important, Tina, and listeners because um, the journos, yeah, they're looking for, for people who are going to be going to give them what they want, but they are going to check you out online. And one of the things I bang on about Tina is creating this helpful content is someone you know I always say someone's got to be the most helpful in your industry it may as well be you and that means you know creating those videos those blog posts those podcasts whatever it is yeah. so that when someone does google you um you've got stuff out there and you know you look as though you know what you're talking about exactly yeah. yeah, love that. Where do you get the list of journos? Um, you know, uh, do you identify journos who are the opinion leaders in your industry? Mm, I tried everyone until someone <laughs> bit. <laughs> <laughs> Throw um, that so line basically, in. Basically, uh, in the magazines and the newspapers, you open the front page and it lists all of the editors. So I would just call them and call them and then email them and then call them to make sure they received my email. Wow. <laughs> so a bit of a pain in the ass. Yep. Uh, but it works. It works. So And it's free. <laughs> yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when you're on a small budget, you know, you might make a fool of yourself or you might feel like a bit of a scab or whatever it, <laughs> it is you're referring to, but you're getting a lot of promotion that people are – I mean, I know in my local paper, a, a little tiny – one by eight ad is $750, mm-hmm. whereas last month we had a full-page story in there for nothing. And that, yeah. so what's that worth? I, I know what I'd rather. Wow. wow, love it. So where's the 15 grand go? Because all that's – I mean, you, yeah. you're not factoring in your time. Um, no. If you did, your marketing budget would just increase by uh, a yeah, multiple. Yeah, yeah, And I do spend a lot of time on it. Like I won't, I won't lie and say it happens, happens mm. in an instant. I probably spend a couple of hours a day on marketing. Great. Oh, yeah. music to my ears. And yeah. and let me guess, you enjoy it. You can't wait for it. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's, that's the best part of my job because right there. there's, there's something really achievement orientated of, of getting yourself. It's so egotistical, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> Wait, look at my stuff up in lights everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> love it. I don't care how you frame it in your mind. It, it's a hobby and you love it. Time yeah. becomes less of, a, less of a problem because you just want to be doing what you're doing and that is marketing your business. And right. most business owners – uh, don't think like that. It's an expense. It's a dark art. It's a pain. It's like, gosh, you know, my my mission, my mission is to turn that thinking around um, and create a movement of oh, marketing absolutely. is a hobby. Yeah, and while while the mainstream think like that, it makes it really easy to be above <laughs> your competitors as well. Yeah. I mean, I know in the in the space of primary tutoring centres, there are a lot of much bigger brands than what we are. But often, when people try and Google them, we come up. So mm-hmm. we get a lot of their customers now as well. 
So it's really worth investing the time and learning all about it. And there's great online marketing courses as well that you can go into. Um, so it's really worth learning about. Love your work, Tina. I've loved talking to you. Yeah, thanks you, uh, for teaching. Yeah. You, oh, I didn't it. answer your question of, of what I spend the 15000 on. Yeah, what? Do you want me to do that really quick? So really quickly um, – Mainly social media at the moment, Facebook advertising oh, yeah. is what we're doing, and good old flash and flyers. Oh, I gotta love a flyer. Do you go oh. the Do you go the DL or the A four? I go the DL. Yeah, I thought you'd be a DL, <laughs> double sided. Yep, double four, sided, four full color, color. Oh. fifty GSM, never oh. anything less. You are showing off. Yeah. You are showing <laughs> off. Goodness yep. me, uh, yep, yep. and and distributed uh, under uh, under windscreen wipers. No, uh, that's just rude. <laughs> <laughs> It's just rude. <laughs> That's just rude. No, mainly ours because of our target market. We put them in daycare centre pockets for the kids to take home. Oh, he's branding the kids. God, yeah. that's uh, – yeah, I love that. Yeah. You'd, be, you'd be getting tattoos on them next. We do have big and bright tattoos. <laughs> <laughs> uh, non-permanent, I hope. Non-permanent. Hey, okay. Tina, uh, love it. Thank you, listeners. Um, if you want to hit Tina up on – I'm guessing you're on Twitter. I am, yeah. What's your Twitter handle? It's uh, uh, Tina underscore Tower. Let her know that you heard her on the show and that you love what she's doing because she loves a bit of she loves a pat on the back. <laughs> if you think you are, if you, you've got it in it's your true. Yeah, true, exactly. If you've got it in you for a uh, a franchise e of Begin Bright, uh, good luck with that. You'll have to get through the <laughs> Tina Doberman, but you can go to beginbright.com.au. Um, otherwise, just just send her flowers because she's just doing good things with our children. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Tina. Thank you. Bye. Hope you liked that fireside chat with Begin Bright's Tina Turner. What a lovely lady. Gee, she's full of energy, full of passion, full of love. No wonder she won Telstra Young Businesswoman of the Year. No surprises there. No competition. She would win hands down. My top five learnings from that fireside chat, thanks to the very good folk at Net Registry. Number one, the easiest way to make a story is to be a story. Love that. Hey, that's a tweetable right there. Tweet it out. Number two, install and document systems for everything. Now, this is not my cup of tea, but I understand how important it is. And documenting everything you do in your business, A, is a good thing to share with your staff, but maybe one day you might want to franchise out, hey? Build that empire. Number three, like this one, be brief. More doesn't make you smarter. Don't you reckon there's this kind of thing out there that if you write a long document, then it makes you look smarter? Yeah, not true. In relation to getting publicity journalists don't want a long document cut to the chase keep pulling out words until it stops making sense don't think being verbose equals your level of intellectuality is that a word number four enter awards i like that we talked about it in episode 222 about how to leverage them but i like the idea of entering awards and hey if you win them tell the world Make sure it's relevant to why the world wants to know about those awards, but it's a good thing. And tip number five, learning number five from Tina, thanks to the very good folk at Net Registry, have a powerful why. Get clear on why it is you do what you do. We talk about it a lot inside the Small Business Big Marketing Forum. If you haven't got a powerful why, here we go. Should you be doing what you do? I'm guessing if you can't identify your why, you're probably not happy in your business. Is that true? Hey, leave me a comment. Leave me a comment about any aspect of what you've heard on the show so far. Head over to smallbusinessbigmarketing.com. This is episode 223. And let's keep the conversation alive. Oh, I love this marketing quote of the week. You ready? Another tweetable. Send it out. Tell the world. Put it on your Facebook. Tell them you heard it. It's on the Small Business Big Marketing Show. The quote of the week is, excuses are the nails used to build the house of failure. Ooh, that hurts. 
What are your excuses? We've all got them. Oh, by the way, that's from Anon. Don't know who wrote that. Just found it on the web. I like it, though. Excuses are the nails used to build the house of failure. They get in the way, these excuses, don't they? We've all got them. My arm's been an excuse. Still get stuff done. Pain. I'm tired. That's an excuse. Got to move on. Got to keep the dream alive. I hope you are, and I hope there's something in that marketing quote of the week just for you. Righto, team, that almost, almost, not quite, brings us to the end of episode 223 of Australia's number one marketing show. Next week, got the founder of a discount variety store that's doing very, very big business on the Apple Isle, which we call Tasmania. The business name, Shiploads. Yep, Shiploads. Wait for that. It is going to be a ripper interview. It is a ripper interview. I've already done it. Hey, I'd love to see you inside the forum. Head over to crankmymarketing.com and uh, spend some time. Ask any marketing question that's on your mind and myself and other motivated small business owners will answer it and move you, you and your business forward. A big thank you to the very good folk at Net Registry who are there to get your online marketing sorted. So please head over to netregistry.com.au if you need any aspect of that part of your marketing sorted. Until then, I'm Timbo Reid, sitting here in Melbourne, Australia, trying to build your small business into the empire that it deserves to be. May your marketing be the best marketing. Bye for now. You've been listening to the Small Business Big Marketing Show with Tim Reid. Want more marketing goodness? Then visit smallbusinessbigmarketing.com.